can't see you. Oh, I can see you now. Great. Awesome. Um, Hi. So just for the benefit of everyone, um, why don't we just say how we know each other? <laughs> well, <so laughs> how do we work together? We work yeah. together at Homerton Hospital. Yeah, that's right. So um, if any of you guys at home don't know, uh, Dr. Yosra is like the specialist in doing non-surgical rhinoplasties. So if you've got any questions or comments about doing non-surgical rhinoplasties or indeed any other non-surgical stuff, please just let us know. Um, but you put out a request for some of your followers before uh, for questions, didn't you? So maybe yes, I did. we I've got a few. rattle through them. Oh, first of all, let's just talk about your um, preferred product for noses because somebody did ask me that earlier. So I like to use Tioxin Ultra Deep. I think it's got 25 milligrams per mil of uh, hyaluronic acid in there and it's got quite a high G prime. So it's got good lifting capacity compared to, say, Juvederm Voluma, which I think is a bit softer. I prefer Tioxin Ultra Deep. Or... Juvederm Volux mm. um, is something that I'm trying uh, more and more so on clinic, which I think is pretty similar. But I'm still, I still prefer Ultra Deep. And are you, are you using it just in the original syringe? You're putting it in insulin needles. How are you doing it? So I decant it into a 30 gauge um, insulin syringe, and then I'm injecting it into bone right down to the base on the bone, usually above the hump below the hump and at the tip to lift and contour the nose. Um, and I feel I have better control with an insulin syringe compared to the thicker, longer needles that come with the um, with the actual syringes of the product. Wow. Also, Tioxane Ultra Deep for all the injectors, they don't come with the 27-gauge needle anymore. They come with a 25-gauge needle, which is huge. So you don't need putting that in anyone's nose. So I decant. Um, I prefer to do it that way. What do you do? I do the same thing. I use a, a 32 gauge um, needle um, from Amelia, which is quite nice. Um, mm. Do you ever do you ever do a little prayer before you do a nose? <laughs> <laughs> I always do a little prayer. You know what? Noses. The reason why Sarah is asking that is because noses are the highest risk area that we can treat in the face. One of the highest risk areas. So we know that the blood vessels in the nose connect directly to the eyes. And um, there's a risk of causing a blindness when you're doing non-surgical rhinoplasty. And I often say it's about three in a million. So it's rare, but it's still something that can happen. Um, so uh, from what I know, Sarah, there's about 150 reported cases of blindness worldwide to date. And 33% of those come from the nose. Mm -hmm. So the nose is deemed a high-risk area. And it's kind of one of those areas that I think that you shouldn't really dabble in if you're going to do it you know really focus a lot on noses because you've got to really learn that how they respond and where the blood vessels are and it is risky um but if you stick to the the right plane so in the center of the nose don't do and don't try and be a hero and inject the sides of the nose choose the right patients um then your risk is low and i tell my patients you're more likely to be struck by lightning <laughs> but it's a risk so it's one of those things so yeah i do do a prayer i do a prayer every single <laughs> with every single nose <laughs> um somebody's just asked a question yeah ewan's here as well by the way ewan um, oh hi ewan yeah. <laughs> the nitrous the nitrous oxide is mine <laughs> <laughs> um somebody's just asked what do you think about cheek fat removal on men I don't know, it's, it's not something do that they, I do. Do they mean buckle fat pads? Or? I, I don't know, it didn't specify just the cheek fat. I'm guessing that they mean buckle fat removal. Yeah. It's not something that I do, but you, you know, I'm not, hollow. Yeah, um, I think that temporarily it will probably give a good look for a man because you're creating that hollow. However, I think long term, you're predisposing yourself to premature aging. So it's not something that I'm a huge advocate of. Um, it's not something that I do or offer to my patients in clinic either. Mm. Yeah, me too. So you, you had a bunch of questions, didn't you, that people had sent in before? Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to start at the top. So, okay, so this is one that we get a lot of. So I got cheek filler before the lockdown. Um, I'm thinking of having it dissolved. Will my face stretch or sag? You know, difficult question to answer, but in reality, the amount of filler that you place on a normal... Uh, patients is quite minimal so if you did have to have a reversal done it's not you're not going from an inflated balloon 
back to your face, hopefully. You've had it done in stages. So if while the, the uh, filler that um, is injected is, is natural, it's called hyaluronic acid, you can dissolve it with a product called Hyalase. Hyalase can temporarily remove some of your own hyaluronic acid, but the reality is it comes back quite quickly. So no, your face is not going to stretch or sag after having fillers or having it dissolved, or if you decide to do fillers and then not to have fillers done again in two, three, four, five years, you're not going to end up looking worse off. Do you agree, Sarah? I, I think it depends on how much filler we're talking about because we've all seen those very big kind of overinflated. Yeah. So in my experience, if somebody's had, you know, 25 centimeters of Juvederm Bloomer <laughs> put in there and you dissolve that, then you might look a little bit, but of course it's, it's not really an everyday occurrence. And the way to fix that is just don't do it in the first place, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but just with yeah. a small amount, you're not going to have that issue. So rest easy. Mm. Somebody's mm. just asked you a question there about non-surgical rhinoplasty. Hi, you have said that I'm not the right candidate to get non-surgical. I've seen a lot about plasma fibroblast sculpting and tightening in the nose. What are your thoughts on plasma? I would say I have my doubts that that would work. Um, plasma results in sublimation of the tissues. So uh, in theory, it works well if you're dealing with scar tissue, you want to shrink a scar tissue, or you want to treat lines and wrinkles. Um, but with nose, you actually need to change the structure of the nose. I, you can do that with surgery by removing a hump or non-surgically by adding products above and below the hump to mask it. Um, Causing skin contraction isn't going to achieve that with uh, with plasma. So I would say don't waste your time or money. Um, if, if you got plasma, you doing Plexar or Plasmage? I used to do Plexar. I used to do Plexar, but I'm not a big fan of it. I actually think it's quite a high risk procedure, especially in my cohort of patients. I see a lot of patients who are Asian backgrounds, um, so darker skin type, dark hair, um, and I have seen post inflammatory hyperpigmentation with it. So I'm not a big fan of it. What about you? Uh, so we, I think it depends on the case. Yeah, totally. Mm, we use plasmage, and I, I feel like it, on the right person with the right kind of skin, it works well. But they do have to be prepared for that that downtime, which can be a bit debilitating for some people. I mean, gosh, the amount of edema that some people get afterwards is is something, isn't it? But yeah. but I, I do think it has a place. Um, just maybe it might have been sort of oversold slightly before um and it, it, it yeah you can't use it to fix everything uh, it, it, no. you know, there's too much skin laxity you just have to snip it off you know i don't think that the downtime with plasma or plexa is going to be any more significant than actually having a blepharoplasty in a lot of i agree cases. with you i totally agree with you i used to use it for blepharoplasty i think in, in minimal laxity in the upper lid area in a white Caucasian background, then you're going to get some degree of contraction and you'll get a nice result. But in really heavy lifts, you're going to get all the swelling and scabbing for two weeks. Really, just go have surgery, I yeah. think. Uh, do you agree? Yeah, totally. Um, let's see. Are you using calcium hydroxide for li No, I don't use calcium hydroxide appetite. So they're talking about radius for yeah. liquid rhinoplasty because you can't dissolve it. Um, and that goes back to using fillers that are reversible. So in a worst case scenario, if you need to get the filler out, um, especially in a high risk area, you want to be using a reversible product. So I use um, hyaluronic acid only, dermal fillers in the nose. I use Radius in other areas, sometimes in the cheeks or in the hands, but in the nose, no. Mm, that would really scare me actually, doing that. Yeah. yeah I wouldn't be comfortable. Uh, somebody's asked about tear trough yeah. treatment. Please. What's, the, what's the question? I want tear trough. I want. It runs in my family genetically, but I'm only 19. Please give me advice. Well, something that I would say is, if the earlier you do it, a treatment like that, the easier it is to do. So by the time that somebody presents who's maybe mid 40s, 50s, and they've developed an awful lot of volume loss underneath the eye, it becomes quite difficult to treat, and the subsequent skin laxity as well means that it's very hard. Uh, to go ahead straight away and fill it. Sometimes you have to do some skin tightening treatments as well first. Um, I'm using a TSR Redensity 2 underneath the eye mainly. Um, if there's a lot of tissue laxity, then maybe some Sonicos or PRP first. What about yourself? I use Redensity 2 in the tear trough as well. Um, and then we do um, microneedling with Intracell. 
and growth factors from AQ Solutions. And I think that gives a nice result. But I think people need to, again, my cohort of patients, a lot of my patients are um, Fitzpatrick skin type 3, 4, 5, so Asian backgrounds. And you got to really be clear about the fact that if they've got hyperpigmentation, so the skin is discolored, the filler is not going to get rid of skin hyperpigmentation, what it will treat is hollowing under the eyes. Yeah. Um, and sometimes if you've got really deep hollows, as is the case in a lot of my patients, one session where you're, you're using one mil, you're using half a mil per eye, isn't necessarily going to give you um, the, the end result. So sometimes it needs to be treated in stages with one mil every uh, month for about three, two to three sessions, depending on the person. Um, I don't think it's a one size fits all or a, um, you know, a certain one, one dose fits all. You've got to treat it depending on the extent of hollowing for the patient. Um, in your case, uh, Sarah, how, what are you saying? Is one enough or do you usually need to do a couple of sessions? I think it depends. If the patient's also got a malar split as well, then I like yeah. to treat that first and then go to the, the tear drop. Something that I'm really loving at the moment is um, a mesotherapy product uh, called Light Eyes from Promo Italia. So it contains glutathione mm. and vitamin C and I'm finding that really helpful for people who maybe don't have uh, a depression underneath the eye. They've just got mm. some hyperpigmentation. It works really well so they need four sessions with that. It's a good treatment. What's that one called? Uh, Light Eyes from Promo Italia. What do you think of Redensity 1? So it's a skin booster filler. Yeah. So sometimes I do a bit of a sandwich technique where I'm using Redensity 2 deep to lift yeah. the hollowing. And then superficially, I might be using something like um, uh, Restylane Skin Boosters Vital Light yeah. and just improve the texture of the skin under the eyes. It works great if you've got like fine lines and wrinkles or dehydrated skin. Um, I've not tried Redensity 1 under the tear trough area. Oh, um, yeah. I have the rest of the paper. What do you think? I used to do that actually. I used to use the Redensity One um, in the under eye region until I started using the light eyes. I think uh, they're both good. Um, I think you, there's more downtime with the Redensity One because uh, with with the light eyes, they'll only get about 12 hours worth of swelling. But I've seen with the Redensity One, 10 days occasionally. Um, which, yeah. yeah, some people. And bruising. Yeah, sometimes, although I do with the cannula, but I, I find that I get more bruising actually with the mesotherapy because you're injecting more times. Um, yeah. Yeah. Somebody just asked Okay, we've got another question. Go on. No, it was for you. It's a correct to deviate the septum. Oh, that's what I was going to say. I was going to say sometimes I even do a little prayer before doing a tear trough as well because that also makes me hold my breath. <laughs> yeah. You know what, we, we, the, the things we do are, um, you know, they have their risks, but we're careful injectors. And, um, and I always say to our, my patients, look, that nobody's gods and we can't say 100% you're not going to have a complication. But what we can say is we will do everything that we can to reduce the risk by using safe techniques and safe um, injection safe planes. And we know how to uh, recognize if a complication has happened and can reverse it if necessary. But, yeah, I think... Um, I always say people say, why do you choose noses? I'm like, no, no, I didn't choose noses. Noses chose me. It just <laughs> kind of happened. <laughs> um, going back, would I have chosen that? Probably not. I'd, I'd sleep better at night if I, if I chose another um, area to kind of specialize in. Okay, here's another question. I have a scar that has made my top lip unbalanced in terms of volume. Yeah, this is common. Is there a way that I can minimize the scar and balance out my lips? I'm after a natural look with the lips. Thank you. Um... I love using uh, a combination here. I think um, when you scar it on the lip, I really, really, I really understand that because I have a scar on my lower lip. Um, I fell when I was about eight years old and I ended up with a massive scar on my lower lip and um, it left a little, a little lump. And until now, I get people that DM me, what's wrong with your lips? Or is that filler in your lips? I'm like, no, it's a scar. Um, but it was worse when I was younger. I kind of feel like I've grown into it. So scarring on the lips can be treated by breaking up the scar tissue. And one of the ways that you can do that is a treatment called Intracell. And I know, Sarah, you also have Intracell, mm -hmm. don't you? Correct. Um, so that's medical-grade microneedling with a, another treatment modality called radiofrequency, which delivers heat to the scar. And in doing that, it breaks up the scar tissue. And you usually need about two to three sessions to improve the, the scar. And then you can use a really light filler underneath um, and either side of the scar to even it out. Or you can do something called subcision, 
where we go underneath the scar and again just break up the scar tissue to soften it and then you can add filler either side. Um, and I think uh, you, you get nice improvements but again it's about managing expectations, expect improvement and not necessarily perfection. So for me, uh, when I look at myself now, I'm not bothered by my scar anymore, I don't see it as much anymore so it's improved with microneedling um, but I know it's never going to be 100% perfect. So you can kind of just see it there. Oh, when I smile, it's a little, little bit raised there, but I'm not too bothered. I think it's an improvement, and I'm happy with that. Uh, Ewan just said, are you using Intracell on the lip? Yeah, I'm using it up, up to the lip, yeah. yeah. Somebody on um, um, YouTube just asked, can you discuss options for lower face slimming? My concern is fullness of the lower cheek. You go for that. Well, I think... It just depends really on, on what's going on there because uh, it might be that maybe your masseter is a little bit full, maybe your parotid gland's a little bit full, you could use some toxin there to slim that down. Or it might just be that you've got some heaviness uh, in the jowl area, in which case I'd recommend some skin tightening treatments like maybe ultrasound or radio frequency. You could even consider putting some small threads in if the uh, amount of heaviness is a bit more significant. And then, of course, you can change the shape of the face using hyaluronic acid or other dermal fillers. So if you widen the, the cheekbone here, uh, it will automatically make the face look a bit slimmer and more triangular. Um, that, that's my two pence worth anyway. Yeah, I tend to do that as well. If I have a patient that comes in with like, do they mean, when they say heaviness, do they mean double chin or do they mean jowls? I'm not sure, it just says lower cheeks. Oh, well, that's my issue now. But anyway, <laughs> um, it's, double chin, it depends on how big the double chin is. So you can try and get rid of the fat. I don't do acrylics. I don't know if you do acrylics. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, I do. Um, I have a machine called Cool Sculpting, which is permanent non-surgical fat removal using a fat freezing technology. So it freezes the fat to minus 11 degrees, and then it's permanently, uh, you know, you get rid of it. You lose about 30% per session. But that's if you've got a, a fat pad that's big enough to get into the Cool Sculpting applicator. If not, I often lengthen the chin and give you more of a kind of a V-shaped tapered chin, which hides the double chin area. I think that's really common technique that a lot of us injectors use um, to just lengthen the face and hide that double chin area. Um, worst comes to worst, wear a scarf and just hide it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, the, the cool, uh, sorry, not the cool sculpting, the acrylics I'm using more now, the celluform, and I've been injecting it into the jowl itself here, just mm. a little bit, um, and that works quite well. Uh, you do have to be a little bit judicious because um, it can dissolve the myelin um just temporarily um so the patient goes so they get nerve damage uh just, yeah. it's temporary um mm -hmm. for maybe a few weeks afterwards if you don't you know pull it away enough but again that mm -hmm. works quite well that's off label um we have a question here far is asking i'm concerned about dark pigmentation under the eyes what do you do for dark pigmentation sarah light eyes the mesotherapy. Like yeah. Yeah. Um, have you tried Tebby Skin Lightning Cream? I have not. I will make a note. Um, so that's, I forget what the company is called. Um, Zainab, if you remember, throw that in here. Um, so it's it's a tyranase inhibitor, so it prevents pigmentation, because we can't use hydroquinone, which is another pigment suppressing agent, uh, which is prescription strength. Uh, up, up until the eye area. So um, I use Tebby Skin Lightening Cream for my patients after doing a little bit of microneedling. But we'll try light eyes and see how we get on with that as well. That's a good, that's a good um, shout. I have another question here. Breastfeeding liquid rhinoplasty. You can't, you can't breastfeed and have dermal fillers, I'm afraid. And you can't have them when you're pregnant either. So enjoy that time and we'll see you on the other side. Uh -huh. Um, how long after my first tear trough can I get my second tear trough? One month. Four weeks is the usual protocol. So you wait four weeks because when you put a uh, tear trough filler in, it always gets better over time because it sucks water in. We call that hydrophilic effect. So it sucks water in, um, it plumps, it lifts, and then Redensity 2, which is the same filler that um, Sarah and I use, has uh, antioxidants in it and amino acids, 14 different nutrients, which help to 
uh, improve the texture of the skin. So that takes about four weeks to kick in. So you never want to over inject the area. It's better to under inject or put, put half a mil, bring the patient back in after four weeks and assess. And you might find that you're happy at that stage or you might need a little bit more tweaking, but it's always easier to add more in than take out. Um, here we go, another one I've got. Um, uh, what are the best thing for crease lines on neck that makes you look like you have rolls of fats? So they're talking about these horizontal lines on the neck. What's your take on that? Um, I normally just fill them, maybe with something like Juvederm Volite. Um, depends yeah. on how much skin we're talking about here. You might even be able to get something like Volbella in there if there's an awful lot of skin. I don't know. Yeah, what are you using? Um, so I use a combination of Profilo, which is an injectable moisturizer, which helps to hydrate and lift the, <laughs> lift the tissues. Thanks. Love you too, Anissa. I just got a nice message there. Made me smile. Um, so I use Profilo. I also use Aliax and Shape and Restore with a cannula, and I go underneath the lines, and I, and I use that to plump it up. And what that does is it stimulates new collagen and adipocytes, so it stimulates little fat cells in the upper layer of the skin which um, improves the appearance of the skin. I've had profile on my neck and I actually really love it. Another thing that you can do is radio frequency. So um, radio frequency and ultrasound to tighten those tissues. You usually need about three to six sessions of uh, radio frequency on the neck to tighten the tissues. It's not going to help with rolls of fat, but it will help with loose skin, turkey neck type of appearance. And I find the combination of radio frequency, profilo, and um, like a skin booster like Volite or, or Aliaxin, Shape and Restore, give a nice result. Have you tried the new Ultracell yet? The new machine? Ultracell 2? Yeah. I have Ultracell 2, that's the one you I have. Got it on oh, are you talking about Ultracell 2 for the body? That's it, yeah. The white one. I haven't tried the... The white one. Yeah. Um, I have it. I think that's the body one, Ultracell Q. No, but they they have applicators for the face as well. I had it done, I think, about three or four weeks ago. I thought it was brilliant. I loved it. I think I'm going to get it. Did you? Yeah, loved it. Um, I have I have Ultracell 2, um, and then Ultracell Q came out, which is the one with the body as well. But I need to look into the science behind that um, and figure out. I mean, listen, if I can if I can shrink away my fat, I'd live in these machines. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do for in quarantine. I'll come out like sculpted. <laughs> That's it. You and so like Ultra Cell Q. Thank you, you. Yeah, you're right. Ultra Cell Q. Yeah. So it, it's got um, a new piece of technology in it where it's not just doing um, micro focused ultrasound, but it's actually delivering like a little line. So you, you're getting an awful lot more surface area being covered. And I've got to tell you, it really made a big difference. It, it's probably not the best time for it to come out just before all this kicks off. Um, but I think afterwards, yeah. I think I'm going to definitely look into getting that. Um, awesome. Did you try Sonicos yet, by the way? There's a question. Sonicos, yeah. what's that? You know the, the hyaluronic acid slash amino acid mixture. Um, people are using it around the eye. I don't know. There was, um, yeah, it's super fast you when you're right. Um, there was a lot of chat about it uh, being like a rival to Profilo in some of the forums. No, I haven't tried it. I mean, I'll have to look into that one. Yeah, it was quite good. Anyway, sorry, go on. What were you going to say? There's a question here. I have had pie for about two years now. P-I-E. What does she mean? I don't know. Pie for about two years. I've used everything such as arbutin, niacinamide, azelaic acid, etc. Nothing has really worked. What would you recommend? Can you tell me what you mean by pie? Do you mean post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation? Must be. Or does she mean... Yeah. Okay. If you if you just let us know what you mean there, we can uh, we'll look into that question. Um, Nadia, you asked that the same for the double chin. Double chin, you can use. Um, Sarah was saying we can use um, something called Celluform or Aqualix, which is a deoxycholic acid. It's an injectable that dissolves fat. Or you can use Cool Sculpting, which is a fat freezing technology to get rid of fat. And then if it's more tissue laxity, you can use Ultracell to tighten the tissues. Uh, which is ultrasound and radio frequency. Uh, I've heard our nose slowly keeps growing over time. What, what can we do to keep a cute button nose <laughs> and not end up with that ugly nose? You're asking me, love. I don't know. We're <laughs> all um, Come and see us and, and we can give you a, your uh, uh, an opinion. And your nose is not actually necessarily getting larger, but what is happening is that you're losing support on the nasal base, the bone around the nose that where the where the nose sits on. 
um, starts to get wider and our support goes so the nose starts to droop um, and also the chin starts to go up so often witches are depicted with a nose that goes down and a chin that goes up but there are things that you can do to keep the nose lifted you can contour the nose you can keep the you can create supports in the lower face to maintain the profile usually with dermal fillers um, and sometimes think, with a touch of botox yeah you, go you have a great nose really oh thanks fantastic yeah amazing oh Thanks. I mean, I think it's a bit bulbous, but really? yeah, thank no, you. Sure. <laughs> um, what do you use to dilute toxin to do meso Botox? Oh, um, just bacteriostatic saline or uh, sometimes like a mesotherapy product as well. So I'll mix it together. I have another question. You have a few lip fillers on your website. Their shape and contour, what's the difference? So the difference between Juvederm and Belotero. Um, I'll give my take on this and then... Um, Sarah, you give your take. So I used to use Juvederm a lot more uh, in the past. Now I really, I really like Belotero, which is a also a hyaluronic acid um, gel, and it comes in different thicknesses. So one is called Shape or Intense, and one is called Contour or Balance. And the Contour is a thinner filler that is used to give an outline to the lips, and the Intense or the Shape gives volume to the lips. Yeah. And the reason why I like it more now than I than Juvederm is because Juvederm is a great filler but it's a little bit more hydrophilic so it sucks more water in and over time I have um, seen that cause a little bit of puffiness and I haven't seen that in Belotero and all of the ultrasound studies and the histology studies show that Belotero integrates better with the tissues um, so you get less long-term inflammation and you get a softer end result having said that I do note that it doesn't necessarily last as long as Juvederm. Yeah. Um, but if it was me, I'd rather something that was a little bit safer in my in my face. Um, and that's why I personally prefer Belotero. But I think you know, I think Juvederm is fine. It just feels a little bit more fillery, a bit more firm than Belotero. What's your take, Sarah? Uh, so I mean, I I like both. Um, I think both have their use. If we're talking about the lips specifically, um, I do quite like the way that the shape and contour comes in a smaller syringe. Um, but I I work with Allegan, so you know that's my. Uh, <laughs> that's the end of that conversation. <laughs> that's my yeah. It's my it's my first and only true love, I guess. Uh, but no, I, I I do like both. I think yeah. they're both great products. I get that. yeah. Somebody, uh, one of the doctors keeps asking about so the, don'ts for liquid rhinoplasty. I think he's asked like three times, so you have to answer. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that question. I'm so sorry. Don'ts. Um, yeah. Don't inject on the side of the nose. Um, I just stick to the center and always make sure that you're resting on bone or on super perichondrium, so on, to, on the cartilage. Don't inject superficially. Um, always aspirate and wait 10 seconds. I've heard some people say, oh, aspirating isn't really going to work. And whilst it may not be a fail safe, I think it's definitely um, kind of, it will definitely reduce the risk of anything happening um, because you'll, you, you know, it's an extra safety measure if you like. Um, and don't do, you know, we call it hero um, We should call it hero, hero rhino. So <laughs> if a nose is just not going to work, and needs surgery, just tell the patient, listen, you know, sometimes I see patients who have really high radix over here that their hump starts very high. Yeah. And if you add more filler here, it's going to start from the, the forehead. And I think that's really unsightly. It's not, it's not aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. I call it an avatar nose. Um, <laughs> and I see that, I see that quite a lot actually. So don't over inject this area because you actually make the nose look bigger. It's better to have a slight curvature than to be too straight here at the top. Um, yeah, that's my don'ts. Um, somebody else also asked about doing tear trough without a needle. But, sorry, because the question came up twice, I thought we'd better answer it. I don't think you can. You need to use a needle. Maybe you're talking about using the Halron pen that everybody seems to be talking about these days on a lot of forums, which I wouldn't touch with the barge pole, by the way. 
um, it's very unpredictable. Why? Well, you don't know where what depth it's going to. Mm. And there was a study my colleague was telling me yesterday on a stream that apparently they did a study using many of these different pens um, on pig skin and to see to which depth the product eventually penetrated. And apparently there was a huge disparity between all the, all the different brands. So, no, I wouldn't. Um, and besides... No, you know, you need you need to know where you're you need to where know where you're at, right? Yeah, exactly, and you know because it's doing it as well over such a wide surface area, you're not going to get that accuracy as well that you need when you're doing something like a like a tear trough. Um, is it safe? Are you using mainly a needle or a cannula? I I use a needle in the tear trough because I like to know that I'm <laughs> on the bone. Yeah, I yeah. I I just. Yeah. I don't know if I think if we're we're talking about maybe the beginning of the tear trough, I'm happy to use a cannula there, but I I just don't see how you can do it um, on the bone with with a cannula. I mean the the muscle is stuck on the bone in the inner corner anyway. Mm. So mm. I don't know what what are you using? Mm. I use a combination. Um, I like to use a cannula on the medial aspect of the tear trough. And then the lateral aspects, I like to use a needle. But it depends. If I can get under there in one injection point with the cannula, I will. Um, but it's surprisingly less painful with a needle. It's actually a lot more comfortable having a needle than a, than a cannula under the eye. Yeah. Um, you risk a little bit more bruising, but uh, not not always. Yeah. I think I think both are really... It depends on, on what works in your hands. Both are legitimate options. Yeah, It's kind of creepy as well, I think, having a needle coming towards your eye. Um, I've had that experience and yeah, it, it was a bit disconcerting. Nice. No, it was very disconcerting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here I have, what are the risks with permanent or semi-permanent fillers? Do you want to get that? Well, I mean, permanent filler, if you have a problem with it, you can't get rid of it. That's my issue with it. So if it becomes infected, you've got a problem. If you're occluding a blood vessel, you've got a problem as well. Semi-permanent fillers, you'll be talking about something like Sculptra or Radies or Elance. I use Radies and Sculptra. I don't use Elance, but it depends on where you're using them. And of course, you, you know, you're not going to use them in a high risk area. You've got to look at your risk profile. So like user was saying before, um, for example, we wouldn't use radius on a nose because it's a high risk area. You want to be able to use hyaluronic acid because it's reversible. Um, but if you're talking about using radius on a jawline with a cannula, then I'm all for it. Any comments? Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you. Uh, could you please let me know the rough estimate of the expenses involved in getting a non-surgical rhinoplasty apart from the travel? I think that's going to depend patient, um, clinic to clinic. So go on the clinic's website and look at their prices. You're probably going to see anywhere between, I'd say, probably 500 to 700, 800. It depends on, depends on where it's being done and who's doing it. Intracell causes trauma to the skin. My skin scars extremely easily. Is there a risk the treatment would cause more scarring? Um, do you want to get this or... or um, Speak. Okay, so Intracell. Intracell uses tiny, tiny oh, needles. So you've I got can't. like a little. I've actually. Oh, come. I. I. Who's getting this? Me or you? You're all. Okay, like, I'm gonna answer this question about Intracell. What's going on with the internet? Yeah, so are you? I think our internet is slowing okay. down. Um, but we're, let's just keep, so I'm going to answer about Intracell. So Intracell uses a small stamp like, um, it's about this, this, uh, large stamp and it's got 49 tiny, tiny micro needles that are, um, insulated and deliver a heat energy at the tip. They're super, super fine. So they do not cause scarring in themselves. Temporarily, you will have some redness. You might have some roughness as it um, settles, usually for about a week or so. But I have never seen scarring um, from Intracell. Hey, Kish. Kish has just come on and he said, I was doing a nose the week before and I got a positive aspirate. Yeah. Well, see, that's why aspiration is so important because if you didn't aspirate there, imagine you injected. Um, that would have been scary. Yeah, okay. Hope you're feeling better, Kish. Um, I have a question here. 
Can you aspirate through those um, insulin syringes satisfactorily? Yeah, you can. Well, you know, I think it's a subjective debate. Um, uh, when I'm using a uh, insulin syringe, I'll aspirate for a minimum of 10 seconds. But if I'm doing a high risk area like the tip um, or inferior to the dorsal hump, just around this area, where I've seen a couple of positive aspirates, I'll wait longer. I'll wait about 30 seconds. Um, because it takes that, a lot of research has shown that it takes that length of time for you to get anything back in. So it's just about slow injection technique and less is more, don't over inject. Sometimes uh, after four weeks when the swelling goes down, you notice that you need to put a little bit more filler in, um, but it's better to add more in later than to put too much in now. Um, I have a question here, what would you recommend for FaceTime what would you advise for lower face treatment just above the chin losing firmness? You're talking about jowls. Again, I'd recommend um, Ultracell. I think that's a great non-invasive treatment. It uses ultrasound, which sends heat energy to the muscle. That causes the muscle to contract, tighten, and lift. Use that with radio frequency for a little bit more collagen stimulation or um, threads or dermal fillers. And in a worst case scenario, if you're really talking heavy, surgery. But that's why you need a consultation and an assessment. Mm. Somebody asked a couple of questions about whether or not dissolver is safe. I'm presuming that you're talking about high lays. Um, I would say yes. There are a small number of people who would be allergic to that. So if we're doing it as a non-emergency procedure, I believe it's still advocated to do a patch test. Um, patients always ask, if I have this filler dissolved, is my skin going to look worse afterwards? Um, in my experience of doing... Uh, highlays I've, I've never seen anybody have worse skin after they've had highlays what you can sometimes see is maybe if they've had a build-up of product over the years and maybe they've had the same area re-injected quite a few times and then you highlays that with the intention of dissolving everything that can sometimes be quite a shock um but from my knowledge, I've not seen any paper saying that highlays will cause damage to the skin. Any comments? I agree with you. Um, I've seen, I've, I have seen it where, again, there's an overinflation of the lips, uh, which I think is the most common area that I see that ends up, um, you know, when patients come in, they've had, like, too much lip filler. And I say, look, you need to dissolve this because... It's not, it's, it's unsightly or there's lumps and bumps and we want to start fresh. I have seen in a select number of cases, you get a little bit of a, sometimes just a, patients pick up slight fine lines around their lips temporarily mm -hmm. um, and it goes away after a couple of weeks. So it's nothing that I would worry about. Um, obviously don't have it unless you need it, but you, you, you'd avoid that in the first place by not over injecting. Um, I have another one. Um, is the swelling from the first time you get lip filler the worst? Well, not necessarily. Uh, lips are the area where you're going to swell the most because it's such a vascular area. It's full of blood vessels. And, um, and so when you inject, you're likely to cause um, swelling and p potentially bruising. But that goes away quite quickly. Um, someone said here, I think that was Ewan, said, I sometimes unprime my needle before injecting and aspirating. There's some papers that support this technique for high-risk areas. I totally agree with you, um, Ewan. Um, sometimes I'll change my needle if I'm not using an insulin syringe or I'll just decant my filler into many, many small syringes. So I'm only using that syringe a couple of times and then I'm moving on to the next one. One, because it blunts, but two, because... You then have that um, air in the in the needle, so it's essentially unprimed. But if you're using a needle um, in a syringe, unpriming it first, and then injecting and aspirating has been shown to cause uh, to result in a quicker aspirate. So it's a safer technique. So I think if you're aspirating, that's a great tip, um, and I do that as well. Um, he also said that he doesn't think that overinflated lips go back to baseline afterwards, possibly because of the collagen deposition. You know, I agree with him. Mm. Yeah, especially if it's a very I've seen thick, that too, you know. Mm, like a sausage sort of appearance. Yeah, yeah, I agree as well. 
Um, yeah, I've you, seen that particularly where you get a lot of migration in the upper lip area. Yeah, you've just got to get rid of it, I think, in that case and start again. There's not much that you can do because if you're waiting for it to break down, you're going to be waiting years. Do you want that for years? No. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Best technique for yeah. barcode. I agree. Vertical lip lines. I don't know. Uh, it depends. I think it depends on the cause. Sometimes I like to layer like a little bit of um, Juvederm Volbella with a cannula underneath first and then pick off the individual lines uh, using Volite maybe. Um, I, I guess some people would probably treat that with laser though, maybe CO2, something like that. Is there anything that you're doing mm. different? No. Um, are they talking about the uh, smoker's lines? I'm trying to figure out what she means yeah. by barcode. Yeah, yeah, smoker's lines, yeah. Smoker's lines, um, something like Belotero Balance or Volite or Restylane Skin Boosters Vital, something really fine, or again, Juvederm Volbella, something very, very fine in a cross-hatch technique. Um, but what you don't want to do is kind of over-inflate that area because then you end up looking, having, creating a shelf. So um, just improving the support underneath the lips tends to help, and also treating the lip line tends to help, I think. Um, to spread to spread those smokers lines. Um, I rarely do do Botox in the lip line. Um, I think yeah. you end up causing patients who can't, you know, kiss or, or yeah. use a straw, and it looks a little bit um, unnatural. Yeah, do you agree? Got a lot of people messaging actually, or writing in and asking if we do Botox lip flip. I always say yeah. no. Hmm. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Um, I mean, it doesn't last long, and I think it's a high risk. I have a, I had an interesting question here. One second, what was that? What changes are possible with non-surgical rhinoplasty? Can you make it look smaller and less wide at the base? Yes, you can. Um, but again, it's all about communicating with the patient and expectation management. So you can make the nose look straighter, and the way that we do that is we hide the hump by adding filler above the hump, below the hump, and at the tip and sometimes at the nasal spine so underneath the nose and that just supports the nose and keeps it lifted so it makes it look shorter even though you're adding volume to, to the nose you're actually making it larger it looks smaller because it's not hooked and it's not bent um, and in terms of reducing the width of the nose you can by putting filler right down to the base and what that does is it reduces the, the alar flare to the nostrils but really, really minimally. Don't expect kind of surgical results with that. The non-surgical rhinoplasty leaves you looking very much like you. You have your nose. It just looks straighter and a little bit shorter. Um, you can expect an improvement in deviations. But again, improvement, if you've got a really bad deviation, it may be best to have surgery. If you've got really bad breathing difficulty, it may be best to have surgery. But I know Raul Chetto, who was in this chat earlier, I don't know if he's still there, a few hours say hi, Raul, has, um, is trialing dermal filler to improve breathing. And I have certainly um, heard from my patients that they have had an improvement in breathing, particularly when I treat the nasal spine because you're supporting um, and lifting the septum thereby opening up the um, the airway. So patients can tend to get better uh, breathing temporarily, but still. Uh, that's a technique advocated as well by uh, Dr. Kent Remington as well, um, who was injecting it into the nasal valves for support. And apparently that mm. was improving airway. Um, it's not something that I've mm. tried myself though. Um, no, I think that's probably um, the ENT guys do that. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Somebody was uh, asking about lip flip without Botox. I mean, I guess the lip flip procedure is always considered to be with Botox, right? But you can rotate the lip around a little bit using filler. Um, I send quite a lot of patients off for a lip lift these days, like an actual surgical procedure. Um, surgical, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's a surgeon that um, I'm using for that called Greg Brown, um, who will be on tomorrow, I think. Um, and he has Ooh, some really nice that results. Yeah, really, really nice results. Lovely. And it's all done under a low anesthetic. Mm. That's awesome, yeah. So uh, that, that particularly is helpful for patients who have long filtral columns, isn't it? And they don't like that, that length to the columella. So what they do, and obviously Greg will explain it better uh, tomorrow, is they remove some of the tissue, and they remove some of the muscle, and what, what, to what extent it's done. 
and then they stitch it higher up and therefore the lip flips upwards and the length between the nose to the lip is reduced. So it's good for patients who have really long yeah. <laughs> nose to upper lip yeah. um, area. Surgery not, is often best. It's not a huge amount really that you can do about that apart from you know just doing something surgical. Um, somebody said that they had a uh, swelling, uh, swelling, swelling underneath the eye post filler. It keeps swelling up and then going away again. That's something um, that I've seen uh, certainly with a few patients who maybe don't have great lymphatic drainage around the eye, and that's why it's so important to leave a nice gap between treatments and definitely not over treat. Um, yeah, mm. it's it's a really tough one. That actually. I would just say dissolve it and start again. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, so it w I agree with you. It depends how long ago you had it done. So if you're still within the four-week period and it hasn't settled, give it time to settle. It may still be settling. If it's beyond the six-week period and the product is just not integrating, no, it's not post-filler, it just keeps swelling. Oh, it just keeps swelling without any filler. Oh. Right, so she's got malar edema. So again, that's a lymphatic drainage issue. Um, oh, not much. You can not sometimes much, unfortunately. maybe try like superficial skin tightening treatments like radio frequency or laser or something like that, but there isn't a huge amount that you can do about it apart from massage. Um, well, what do you know about gua sha? Gua, is it gua sha or gua shua? <laughs> it's like a facial massage. Huh, I've never heard of it. Gua sha. So, yeah, so they're using um, like tools uh, that that essentially apparently improves lymphatic drainage, and oh. they're massaging the face, and it can be done under the eyes, around the cheeks, and the yeah. jawline. Um, I don't know if that's something that would be helpful. Uh, obviously, there's no clinical studies there, um, but it's, it's an interesting one to explore and uh, read about. I think it sounds useful for maybe people who do have poor lymphatic drainage and puffiness in the face because that's a, it's nothing that we could really help with, unfortunately. Mm. Someone um, just said very bad visuals and sounds. Oh no, is that is that everybody? I know that you still look blurry. Yeah, I think it's I think it's just on Instagram. It's fine over on YouTube. I don't know why it keeps kind of just dropping in and out. I'm not sure why. Um, Go to YouTube, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, oh, yes, very bad. Sorry, I don't, I don't know why. Uh, Hang so in there. Just asking about um, procedure for a droopy nose, more so when smiling. Would filler work or do I have to get a surgical procedure? Um, I normally put Botox there. Mm. I think a combination of Botox and dermal filler. So the reason why it goes down is because um, you've got a muscle here called the depressor septi nasi muscle. And when you smile, it contracts and it pulls that, pulls the tip of the nose down, um, causing that kind of, you know, downward looking thing. Um, you don't need surgery. You can treat that with Botox and you can treat it with dermal filler. But of course, these things are not permanent. You'll need to repeat it. Botox lasts about three to six months in the area. Dermal filler lasts about a year. Although I've seen it last two years, so it depends on the patient. Uh, somebody's just asked on YouTube, after doing high legs, how long after would you then add filler? Personally, I leave a week at least. Agree. I, 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 I advocate um, ideally two weeks, but a minimum of a week. Yeah. The longer the better, really, isn't it? Yeah, especially if you're doing it for something like a lip where there's been um, extrusion of the filler outside the body of the lip. Um, because if you go ahead and then just put the product straight back in again, that pathway is likely to still be open, so you can see that you get um, migration of it very easily. It's hard to do a good job with the lip unless you give it, you know, a decent amount of time to heal afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here: How to help with the uh, with eye? To, I think she means eye to cheek lines. So they're talking about the malar groove. So there's, you can get these um, lines that go down from the eye down across the cheek. We call it a malar groove or a nasodugal groove. Um, quite difficult uh, to treat because patients can sometimes get what we were, we were talking about earlier, which is malar edema, which is um, like pockets of swelling in the area. Mm -hmm. So it has to be treated in stages. Um, I use dermal filler 
to correct that area, to lift it up. And I often treat the cheek, if the patient has it, I'll treat the cheeks first, leave it a few weeks, and then treat the tear trough to reduce the risk of um, uh, swelling. What do you do, Sarah? Ditto. Exactly the same. No different. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about this question here. <laughs> it says, uh, what's the reason for hardening of fillers? Do you mean like after you've had the filler done, that area swells up? Is, is that what you mean? Because there's such a thing um, where if you get um, a viral infection or a bacterial infection, or even if you're just having surgery for something completely unrelated, any areas that you've had filled can mm. become uh, quite firm and hard. It's... Um, T cell uh, activation, um, but it typically settles on its own. I've actually had it. I've had it myself. Um, mm. I've had it when I've had after sore throat, a gastroenteritis. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it goes away on its own. So sometimes in patients, if uh, it's distressing, we might use uh, some steroids to take that away um, more quickly. Um, do you do the same thing? Hold on, I lost my train of thought. What were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about swelling. You know, when you've had a bacteria oh, infection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I've seen that before, actually. I've seen it in one patient who I treated a long time ago, and she got a really bad case of um, streptococcal sore throat, and everywhere she had the filler sw became mm -hmm. swollen. So um, we just gave her antibiotics and steroids, and it went away. Yeah. You know, it goes away. It's, te it's temporary. It's transient. It can be a little bit frightening when it happens, a bit tender, but it's completely transient. Um, unless they're talking about granulomas. Yeah. Oh, somebody over on YouTube has just asked for some advice on how to find a sugar daddy to pay for all the surgery that they need on their face. <laughs> I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> don't know this might not be the right I don't, know. I don't have one either so yeah <laughs> let us know <laughs> yeah when you find one let me know please <laughs> um here i've got one about columella can you add filler to the columella to build it and make the nose appear slimmer with filler i think you're talking about the tip yes you can um do you do, can you do anything for stretch marks on the body Yes, you can. Again, microneedling, intracell is good for that. Um, I use intracell in, that air, in those areas. Or I have a gun, um, the U225 meso gun. Um, it's basically mesotherapy, and we, we inject into that area. Uh, Sarah, you're my sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ewan. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, think we've. I've never heard of that uh, problem before. What's the problem? I had a nose filler, and when my face hits the sun, my nose bridge looks a bit transparent as light passes through it. Please tell me, is this normal? Mm -hmm. I've never heard of that either. I have seen, um, like, maybe she means like a bluish tinge, which might just mean some of the filler is superficial. Um, but on, I've seen that in the tip. I've not seen that in the bridge of the nose. Um, does SkinAid help with energy, and what difference would it make to your skin? I love SkinAid. SkinAid is a skincare drink that has um, 7,000 milligrams of marine collagen. It's got a high dose of vitamin C, 450% of your recommended daily allowance of vitamin C. It's got um, a natural organic sulfur that helps with acne or inflammation. It's got vitamin B12, a vitamin B6. It's got omega-3, omega-6. Um, so these are all nutrition, it's nutritional support. Um, and I think uh, we were talking, you were talking about nutrition with uh, Dr. Kish the other day, yeah. about how to boost your immunity. And I think at this at this time, these kind of things are quite useful. Um, do you want to give them a lowdown of what, um, yeah, what to so get? Um, just very briefly, uh, we were talking about other supplements that you can take uh, to help boost your immunity. So we listed selenium, uh, zinc, um, melatonin was one. Uh, there was the Neo40, which, by the way, I have for you. Um, we haven't been to the post office yes. yet. Um, <laughs> just taking a multivitamin. Uh, gosh, what else was there on there? Oh, magnesium. I've actually, I wrote it. I, oh, it was really you? good. I wrote it. Down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where did I write it here? So uh, zinc, zinc picolinate. Yeah. 
uh, vitamin C, uh, vitamin D3, 3000 yeah. IU. Yeah. So there's a lot of research that shows that that um, upregulates the immune system and reduces the progression of viral illness to acute respiratory distress. Yeah. So that's, um, that's tell, me, sad topic. tell me about melatonin. It is a sad topic. Um, melatonin. Um, so I was I was talking to my husband about that uh, today, trying to source some melatonin. Um, is that something that you would recommend every night, and can it be used long term? Yeah. I take it every night, every night, just a little bit. Um, it's, it's a very powerful antioxidant. Um, and I have to tell you, I've never slept so good either as when I'm taking the melatonin. Amazing. I'll, I'll send you a picture of the one that I'm using, actually, because I've used a different, few different types, and this one was the best, but I can't remember the name of the brand. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, let me send it over to you. It was good. We're getting some questions about... Oh, body. About skin. And tretinoin, mm -hmm. um, so okay. Obagi, acne and bad peeling. Yeah, I when I've done Obagi, I had peeling for like two months the first time that I did it, uh, mm. which was mm. yeah, it's all part of the course, I guess. Have you ever done it yourself? Is it part of the? Oh yeah, I love. I'm a big Obagi advocate. Um, I yeah. love it, and it for me it really helped with my acne. Um, to the point where if I don't use it for a week or so, I'll come out in spots. So I've come out in three spots because I haven't been using it. And so last night I was back on my tretinoin. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm very, very acne prone. I suffered for, with acne since the age of sixteen. Pregnancy and breastfeeding do me no favors. Um, I look like a volcano during that time, so it's awful for me. Um, and Obaji really changed my life in that respect. Um, but it's not for the faint-hearted. It is. You, you got to remember that it's 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 prescription strength, and it's designed to literally transform your skin. And if you're going to do that, then it has to be done under the supervision of a uh, clinician who can walk you through it and support you on it you will definitely peel for at least six weeks but you'll peel for as long as you need to it depends on how how bad the skin is and most patients i've seen will peel for about i would say eight to nine weeks quite a lot and then it settles down and you might have some mild peeling um so if you and sometimes one in one in four patients will find that their acne looks worse in the first six weeks before it looks better. Mm. That's normal. And again, if that happens, speak to your clinician because there are things that they can do to tweak your regime that can stop that breakout or can help you through that breakout. Whether it's giving you a short uh, course of antibiotics or tailoring the treatment, um, it's totally doable. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Sometimes when acne gets worse before it get, gets better, we call that purging. Um, and patients start to really appreciate the difference in their skin after the three-month mark. So you must stick to your skincare regime for at least three months if you want to see a good difference. Don't don't fall off the radar six weeks in because that's the hard bit. Get through that get through that hard bit and you'll reap the rewards later. Mm. Um, so Cosmolan versus um, got Abaji. Here, retinol or tretinoin? Go. On. Oh, um, so the Cosmolan versus Abaji know. is like. Uh, I think it comes down to this. With the Cosmolan, you get the peeling over and done with in the first week, but it can be brutal. And I mean really, really brutal. Like, sometimes the skin bleeds. It's so damaged afterwards. But then it's all over and done with. With the Obagi, that peeling process takes a lot longer. Um, you're kind of on the hook, like you just said, for a couple of months of maybe some mild exfoliation. But the good thing about that is you can tone it up and down. So if you're really struggling and you know you really can't keep using it, you can avoid such areas such as next to the nose or the corner of the mouth. So uh, you can't do that with the Cosmoline because once it's on, it's on. You just have to deal with it for the next week. Um, so for that reason, personally, I prefer using the Obagi. But if there's a good reason to use a Cosmolan, then yeah, we, we do do that. But it's tough. It's really tough on you. Mm. Do you mm. use Cosmolan? Mm. Me, I don't use Cosmolan. No, no I yeah. use Obagi. It's, it's hard. It's really hard. Uh, so do you use a got three minutes left, and then this is going to automatically cut out. Okay. Yeah. okay. Go for it, guys. Get your questions we, we in. Um, best treatment for PIA. <laughs> yeah. Um, Oli, I've got a question here. Tretinoin all year round or retinol? Yeah. 
Did you want to answer the retinol um, slash tretinoin? Yeah, I think, uh, look, retinol is a derivative of tretinoin. Tretinoin is a lot stronger. It's 100 times stronger than retinol. Really, you're going to be using it if you're treating something. Uh, that's it. Oh, it's over. Gone. <laughs> Hi, we're still going hey. on Instagram. Um, on Go on. Yeah, it, it just cuts off automatically uh, after an hour. Intense pulse light, you know, to Ada. She just asked a question there. Um, it's it's like a, it's a bit like a laser, but it's a broader wavelength. So I guess we should sign off. Okay, fun. awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, no, thanks for coming on. It was fun. It's nice to see you again. I'll see you again soon. Send me the melatonin uh, picture. I will. I'll see you later. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.